Yeah, thank you, KK and the team, for leading us in great songs. And special delight to have Winston van der and Janine with us. They're here not for the carol service, although that's kind of a little reason, but they're here because their son, Jason, is marrying gorgeous Alyssa next Sunday. So... God bless you. Yeah, we are so excited for you, so thankful to God for his mercy and the way he has led you together. So only seven more sleeps, I think. We've been counting every Sunday for months. I've said, how many more sleeps? But uh, God, God bless you richly. And thanks, Winston. It's lovely. Winston led worship here. For those of you who are new, he led worship at Ferndale for about 20 years every Sunday for over 20 years. So it's great to, great to have you back. And boys and girls, how cool it is to have you in church, big church this morning. And I was watching, I was standing over there and I was watching you as you were singing and uh, you really got into it and enjoyed yourselves, didn't you? So thank you for being, for being with us. This afternoon, we're gonna have a picnic on the lawn starting at four o'clock. <laughs> Yay, so you're going to be here. <laughs> so bring your, bring your picnic chairs and picnic blanket and picnic food and just let's just have a good time of, uh, of sharing together before the service at six o'clock. A good chance to invite others to come back with you. The service will be pretty much the same tonight, a few changes, but uh, the sermon will be better, I promise. But uh, come back this evening and uh, we'll enjoy that, uh, that time together. Now, if you have your Bible with you on your phone or in a hard version, won't you find your way into the Old Testament to Isaiah, the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 8. Isaiah, chapter 8. Just take a moment to pray before we look at some of these verses together. Thank you, Lord, for the wonder of Christmas, for the joy of singing your praises, for singing truths and hearing scriptures read that remind us of the great saving grace of our God. Bless us as we look further into this marvel, this mystery of Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the first indications of the Christmas season is the appearance of lights. And uh, we see them all over, usually in the shopping centers before they uh, emerge in our homes. But uh, lights are part of Christmas, aren't they? Christmas lights. We lived in Canada in the beautiful city of Victoria on the west coast for a number of years and no people on earth do Christmas lights the way Americans and their neighbors to the north Canadians do. Oh my word. Uh, and uh, in our city of Victoria, which is about a quarter of a million people, we so enjoyed the lights at Christmas Neighbors compete with one another. They not only put lights inside their houses, but they put lights outside their houses, on the roofs, around the doorways, in the gardens. They have lights of reindeer on roofs flashing, and, and, uh, and their competitions in neighborhoods for the, the best array of Christmas lights. And one of the things we used to enjoy doing around Christmas in Victoria is driving around the city, looking at the, at the lights in the downtown area, parliament buildings beautifully adorned with lights, and then we would drive into the suburbs, and sometimes we couldn't even get to the house that won the prize for the best lights because there was such a traffic jam because everybody in the city had the same idea. And uh, so lights are part of Christmas. But lights are are not just decorative. Lights are also symbolic. They, they say something, they teach us something 
about Christmas. And lights proclaim that wonderful message that Christ has been born. Christmas lights say the light of the world has dawned. Interestingly, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, get this, 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah spoke about the coming of Jesus in these words. The people walking in darkness, this is chapter 9, verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And the interesting thing is that those words were a reference to Jesus. And that is made clear by Matthew's gospel in the New Testament. As Matthew, as Jesus began his ministry, uh, Matthew records it in this way in Matthew 4 from verse 13. Listen carefully. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those were two of the 12 tribes of Israel. He did that to fulfill, here it is, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So Jesus coming to begin his ministry, as we've seen in our studies in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus coming to begin his ministry in that very area was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy made 700 years before his coming was the dawning of light. Now to appreciate this statement, the light has dawned, we need to just recognize the darkness of the world. If we don't understand the darkness of the world, we will never fully understand the wonder of Christmas. And millions of people throughout the world this Christmas will celebrate Christmas, but totally miss the point of it because they do not understand the darkness of the world. How is the world dark? Tim Keller explains that in the Bible, the word darkness refers to both evil and ignorance. It means first that the world is filled with evil and untold suffering. Look at what was happening at the time of the birth of Jesus. And we know from history and from scripture what was happening at the time of his birth. Violence, injustice, abuse of power, homelessness, refugees fleeing oppression, families ripped apart, bottomless grief. And you listen to that and you realize that it sounds exactly like today. You look out on our world today, you look at the news, you flick from CNN to BBC to Al Jazeera to whatever news you choose, ENCA, and, and the picture is a picture of darkness. And you see people scrambling throughout the world to try to find solutions to all of these problems whether it's the UN or the EU or the AU or the ABC, XYZ, there are all these organizations that are spending millions having conferences, convening uh, meetings to try to solve the problem of conflict and war and refugees and corruption and you name it. And uh, everyone's trying to do something to fix it. But they're trying to fix it by looking in the wrong places. And that's what this, the context of this passage shows us. If you look back to chapter 8, um, verse 19, 
they were trying to fix their problems by just human earthly means. Look, read with me from verse 19 of chapter 8. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. They're in darkness. And then notice how chapter 8 ends. People who are just looking for solutions at a human level and not looking to God for his solutions. Notice chapter 8, how it ends. Verse 21, distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. And when they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom and they will be thrust into utter darkness. What's going on there? People trying to find solutions to human problems with merely human solutions. With all of the cleverness of experts and mystics and scholars and politicians and financiers and psychologists and educators and scientists and technology and AI, everything trying to fix the mess the world is in. But it only leads to distress and darkness and fearful gloom. Now it's easy for us, it's easy for us to look outside of ourselves at what's happening in the world around us. And as depressing as it is, I hope you do watch the news because we need to know what's happening. We need to have our hearts broken by what's going on out there. But it's easy for us to, s to stand where we are and to look outward and see the darkness and recognize the problem of evil, the problem of ignorance. But the problem of darkness is not only a problem out there, it's also a problem in here, in here, in our hearts. Listen to what, when the Apostle Paul was writing to people who had become believers in Ephesus. This is what he said to them. Ephesians 5.8, For you were once darkness. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Colossians, the same thing. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Or Peter says the same thing. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who what? Called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the darkness is not just a problem out there. Scripture shows us that the darkness is a problem in here, in each one of us, by nature. By nature, we're bent toward evil. By nature, we're ignorant of God and his ways. And so it's only when we understand the darkness that we can begin to understand and appreciate the Christmas message. Look, let's think next of the promise of light, the promise of the light. We go into chapter nine and notice how the chapter begins. It begins after this description of horrible darkness and its effects at toward the end of chapter eight. Notice how chapter nine begins. Nevertheless, nevertheless. So you've got this bad, 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 bad news. Nevertheless, something is happening. Something's going to change. There's hope. Nevertheless, look at it. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, God humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, that area where Jesus began his ministry. But in the future, this is Isaiah, 700 years before Christ came, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by way of the sea beyond the Jordan. And how did he honor? By the light coming. Look at verse two. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And in those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And so here's Isaiah, 700 years before, 
speaking, guided by the Holy Spirit, about what God was going to do in that very place as he would send Christ the light into that darkness. And of course, when Jesus came, again, those verses in Matthew, leaving Nazareth. Remember, where was Jesus born? He was born in the manger, that's right. And, and what town was he born in? Bethlehem, that's right. And then after, where did he live and grow up? In heaven, he ended up there for sure. Absolutely right, Thomas. What, what town did he grow up in as a little boy? In Nazareth, right? And then as a man, he went back to that area, to Nazareth and the towns around there. But that was all promised 700 years before. And so it says here, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum. Remember, that was right by the, by the Sea of Galilee. That was his headquarters to fulfill what Isaiah had said all those years before. And it fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy that the light will dawn, the light will come into that very place of darkness, which, which is a picture of the world in all its darkness and gloom. Now, how did the light dawn? Let's think for a minute about the dawning of the light. How did the light dawn? Or Isaiah uh, uses a, a, a word that, that the light flashed. Uh, Christ coming into the world was like a flash of light in the in the message, Eugene Peterson translates it this way, for those who lived in a land of deep darkness, light, sunbursts of light. So Jesus' birth was a sunburst of light into the darkness of the world. And verses six and seven, if you look at the text of Isaiah nine, those are the, those are the most well-known among the most well-known Old Testament prophecies of his birth. And uh, they answer the question, how did the light dawn? Look at the text. For, uh, speaking about what's gone before, nevertheless, there'll be no more gloom. Why? For, something's going to happen. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. That's how the light dawned. That's how the light burst forth, shone forth in the darkness of the world. A child is born, a sunburst of light. That's what the birth of Jesus was. You remember from our, our studies in Luke, uh, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, when he was speaking about the, the birth of Jesus in his wonderful song of Zechariah. What did he say? The rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the path of peace. So Jesus coming was likened to the rising sun coming from heaven. Now those words in verse six, for to us a child is born to us his son is given. That's a, a birth announcement. Now, nowadays with all our fancy technology and uh, when a lady falls pregnant, very soon afterwards, I'm not sure how many weeks, they have their the first scan. And so normally you kind of fairly soon know whether it's a boy or a girl and you have sort of a revealing party and it, you know, all your friends gather and they all give you gifts and then if, it's, if the cake is blue, it's going to be a boy and if the balloons are pink, it's going to be a girl. And so you normally know all that stuff and so you can paint the room the right color and it's all, you know, it's all, very, it's all very fancy. But you don't announce the birth until the baby is actually born. But here we have an announcement of a, we, here we have a birth announcement 700 years before the birth. For to you a child is born. That's a birth announcement. To you a son is given. Amazing, amazing 
advance announcement of something that was planned by God, but it's spoken of as already being a fact because of God's plan and purpose. Now, this birth announcement anticipates, and this is important, this birth announcement anticipates the dual nature of Christ uh, when it speaks of a child being born and a son being given. Jesus was not born a son. He was the eternal son of God. So he was not born a son. He came into the world. He really was the eternal son of God. He was born a child. And so you have the, the divinity of Jesus and the humanity of Jesus in that birth announcement. To us, to you, to me, to the world, a child is born, his humanity, in the same way as every other child is born. But a son, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, was given to us for our salvation. And so when Jesus, you think of it, when Jesus covered in blood and slime was pushed out between his mother's legs in that stable in Bethlehem, the promised light dawned. That was God's eternal sunrise that had been planned from before the foundation of the world. The true light, John says, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. But to think of the birth of Christ in those terms. God being born. A son being given, a baby being born to us. And the verse goes on and speaks of the sufficiency of the light. Jesus brings light because of who he is. Look at the, look at the second part of verse 6. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I read this in a little devotional book we're reading for the Christmas season by Paul Tripp. He says this, with words carefully chosen because they were carefully directed by the Holy Spirit, Isaiah is telling us that the Messiah is exactly what every sinner desperately needs. He is the ultimate answer to every destructive thing that sin does to us. Isaiah, with beautiful poetic words, declares that Jesus is all we need. He is the solution to the sin we cannot escape. Long before we were born, God had appointed the one who would be the remedy for every symptom of the sin that would infect us all. And so he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Sin made us foolish. Sin made us foolish. But our Wonderful Counselor has given us his word, his teaching. The Holy Spirit in us to guide us into all truth. To overcome the foolishness of our hearts as a result of sin. He is the mighty God. Sin made us unable to please God, unable to obey God's law. We need help. And Jesus is that help. He is the mighty God who can enable us by his spirit to fulfill the requirements of the law that we otherwise couldn't fulfill. He is the everlasting father. Sin alienated us from God and his family. But the everlasting Father, Jesus, through his blood shed for us on the cross, brought us, brings us into the family of God, into a relationship with him, into a relationship with one another, into a family 
of comfort and care and protection and ultimate airship. And then he is the Prince of Peace. Sin broke and ruined and alienated us from God. Sin messed us up. But Jesus alone can fix us up. That's what peace means, shalom. It means wholeness, health. And by his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, he makes it possible for our brokenness to be healed, for our sin to be forgiven, for us to be restored and conformed to the likeness of Christ. And so in those four names of Jesus are answers to every single need that we have. Everything that sin has done to us, Jesus can restore because of who he is. That's what it means for him to be the light. It's not just a bright light, it's a person who who wants to be this to us. I remember when I was in Sunday school, does anybody know how to spell Jesus? Spell it, spell Jesus for for us. J? Liddy, okay, J-E-S-U-S, J-E-S-U-S, you know what that stands for? J, Jesus, E, exactly, S, suits, you, us, S, sinners. Jesus exactly suits us sinners. That's what his name is, Jesus. Jesus exactly suits us sinners. And that's what these names mean. He's, he's everything we need to deal with the darkness of our hearts, to bring us into a relationship with God. But how do we, how do we receive him? I was thinking the other day of a verse in Hebrews 10. We looked at Hebrews a while ago. The, 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 the writer of Hebrews said this to the people he was writing. He says, remember those early days. Remember, remember those early days after you had received the light. Remember those early days after you had received the light, after you had received Christ. Um, The light has to be received for it to become ours and for Jesus to be that to us. But how do we receive him? There's a hint given in what we looked at in verse 6. To us, a son is given. We receive him by grace. He is a gift. We don't receive him by what we do. Christ is a gift to be received, not a reward to be earned. But to receive Christ as a gift, something's got to happen in you that you may not want to happen. You have to swallow your pride and admit that you are darkness and are in darkness. Tim Keller puts it this way, and I found this very funny and a bit uncomfortable. Some gifts, by their very nature, make you swallow your pride. Here we go. Imagine opening a present on Christmas morning from a friend and it is a book on dieting. (laughs) Then you take another ribbon and unwrap another present and you find it's a book from another friend by the title Overcoming Selfishness. If you say, thank you so much for those gifts, you are thereby um, admitting that you are fat and obnoxious. (laughs) (laughs) And then he says this, 
There has never been a gift offered that makes you swallow your pride to the depths that Christ requires you to do. Christmas means that you are so, let it, don't, don't miss this. Christmas means that you are so lost, so unable to save yourself, that nothing less than the death of God himself could save you. That's how bad we are. That's how helpless and hopeless we are. And so by receiving Christ, you are saying, I am hopeless and helpless and needy and sinful and I need your forgiveness. And that's exactly, if we come back to Jesus, the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and we've read these verses already, but I didn't finish them. Here we're going to finish them. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And then this, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And as he began to preach, what was the first word that came out of his mouth? Repent. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> if he had said hello <laughs> if he had said hello we would all feel good <laughs> stood up in the boat and said hello But he didn't. <laughs> he stood up in the boat, or he stood on the shore, and the first word that came out of his mouth was the word repent. Repent. Repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. So yeah, he doesn't just say hello to you. He calls you to turn to him and to trust in him alone for your salvation. Repent, it's repeated over and over. It's the first word of the gospel. When, J when John the Baptist began preaching, his first word was repent. When Jesus began preaching, his first word was repent. When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit had convicted that vast crowd of their sin and somebody shouted out in the crowd like that little boy or little girl. Someone shouted out in the crowd, what must we do? Peter's first word was repent. And it's only as we repent of our sin and put our faith in Jesus that the light dawns in our hearts bringing life and beauty and clarity to all of life. And that's what Christmas calls us to. To receive the Christmas gift is to say, I was so bad that God had to come from heaven, take flesh and die in my place. That's what it means to celebrate Christmas. Let's pray together. How wonderful, how wonderful, our God, is this message of Christmas. We thank you that in Jesus, light has dawned. He said, I am the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so, Lord, we come 
hearing your word ringing in our ears, in our hearts, repent. And Lord, by your grace, grant repentance to those here this morning who have never repented of their sin, never received you into their lives by faith. Granted today they would receive you as the Christmas gift that will change their time and eternity and fill them with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.